This is Spiritual Civilization, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Spiritual Civilization. My name is Pastor Evans, and I'm joined here by uh, <laughs> these wonderful gentlemen. Uh, on my extreme left, there is Mr. Lely Mandela. He's smartly dressed, as you can see. And then on my, my immediate left hand side here, seat of power. Uh, I am uh, this this man here is called Robbie Omol or Robinson Omol. And uh, my name is Pastor Evans. So, welcome once again to Spiritual Civilization where we meet together to break bread, decode the word, and uh, basically be able to discuss a, a couple of topics uh, that that would be of interest to you. So, even as we start, I'd like us to just begin with the word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today, O oh Lord, to say thank you. Thank you, Jehovah, my God, for your presence. Thank you, mighty Father God, for everything that you have done for us, O oh Lord. For your faithfulness, my Father God, your mercies are new every morning, O oh God. All we can do is say thank you, Jehovah God, because, Lord, you have sustained us, my God. Father, Lord, we pray, Lord, for this broadcast, O oh God, for each and every person that is viewing, O oh Lord, this broadcast, my Father, Lord, I pray a blessing upon them, my God. I commit their minds, their hearts before you, my God, that at the end of this broadcast, my God, may they be transformed, my Father. May their minds be renewed, Jehovah, my God. We pray all this believing and trusting. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. So previously on spiritual civilization, we began a topic on salvation. And today we have the opportunity of basically doing a part two or continuing on with the same. And uh, we are joined by our, our wonderful host, uh, the Bishop Gobanga Jeho. Bishop, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Storm Z, AKA Baba Mzito Onyango, <laughs> the one and only one. <laughs> the one who mesmerizes everyone hey. in this time and in this season. Hey. The hey. one who moves in dimensions. Hey. Hey. I can say so much about him. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I remember in part one, at the very onset, I talked about the fact that we will be trying to uh, discuss about um, some very common uh, words. I may not want to refer to them as synonyms, but these are common. Uh, these are common words or phrases that are associated with uh, the word salvation, which is our topic for discussion in part two. Now, these are words such as uh, to be born again, mm. uh, being a convert. Um, what other word? There's being born again, being, being a convert, saved. being saved. Mm. Is there any other? Believer. Being a believer, yes. <laughs> being born again, being saved, being a convert, being a believer. And I think before we even go further, I would like us in this, uh, at the onset of this session, to try and uh, see if we can uh, elucidate uh, more on these particular words. Uh, in the context of uh, our subject today. What does it mean to be a believer? What does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be a convert? What does it mean to be saved? Because these are words we use. But we must be very sure that uh, people understand exactly what we mean. And I want to believe that uh, you gentlemen who are seated uh, in this panel you are in a better position to be able to elucidate further, maybe to break it down. Mm. So, yeah, let's begin. <laughs> what does it mean? Probably we can we, we can start in this order. What does it mean to be saved? When somebody says, I am saved, what is this person trying to suggest? Mm. That I am saved. What does it mean to be saved? <laughs> uh, basically, it means... Uh, from most people's perspective, is that the person has dedicated their life to living by uh, the ordinances of the Bible, of mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically they are saying, I am 
I have accepted the sal- uh, salvation of Jesus Christ mm. that was uh, born on the cross, mm. and I have uh, subscribed to His way of living. Okay. Then I'll, therefore, followers will then probably ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a believer? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think it's um, it's it's the, it's the same thing. Um, one of the things that I've I've noted also is like the old saints, the saints of old used to call themselves believers of the way. Um, mm. And it is it meant that they had put their faith and their trust in Christ Jesus, who is the way. Yeah, so even in our context, when somebody says, I am a believer, it means that they have uh, put their faith in Christ Jesus, meaning that everything about their life is derived from him. So whatever um, benefit that they are able to attain to, it will come from Christ. Uh, Stormzy, what does it mean to be a convert? To be a convert basically means that you have yielded your life completely to the dictates of scripture as well as what Jesus or Christ himself would desire you to do. So you're, we refer to it as a convert because of the fact that you basically converted from the ways of the world and you've basically been inducted into the ways in which Christ would desire you to live. Mm. And then last but not least, what does it mean to be born again? When somebody says, I am born again, what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's also this. I, I believe born again was derived from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus and um, it was mm. referring to the fact that you're supposed to be uh, born spiritually. Yeah. And that that is now the regeneration, what we call regeneration, that your spirit is is has been made alive and mm. now you are alive in Christ. The same way you would be born like in the natural as a baby and you would grow so now you have been born spiritually and now you're growing spiritually through the work of sanctification yeah you know in um, other bible uh, versions to be born again basically means to be born from above mm-hmm. you know you're born from above to be born from above basically means that um, the nature of your second birth Mm-hmm. is a nature that transcends time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a nature that uh, that transcends uh, every other dictates of, uh, of, 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 of humanity. To be born again basically means to be born from the place of your origin, if I may put it uh, uh, that way. And um, what is it that makes a person to be born again. Yeah. How does one mm. get born again? <laughs> How does one get saved? Mm. Mm. Do we get saved by saying the sinner's prayer? <laughs> I know that would be the immediate answer that any other person <laughs> probably here and as well as also those who are watching at home probably they will think about that. But is that really the case? Um, yeah still in the context of uh, the subject salvation. Mm -hmm. So can we break it down for people? Yeah. Mm. Um, Okay, yeah, I can go (laughs) first. (laughs) Um, I I believe to be born again, um, there are a number, uh, there's, there's, there's what we we've usually ascribed to, like, um, as Bishop has said, that you say the sinner's prayer, then you are expected to live this particular life. <laughs> but what I actually noted from scripture and even just from my own personal devotion uh, in my relationship with God, I've seen that it is actually when one repents 
and repenting is not um is not a word on its own it's repenting repent toward god you you turn away from sin you turn away from self you turn away from every precondition everything that you had uh ascribed to i even submit that you turn away even from your own achievements you yeah. turn away from your failures you turn away from uh your past and you turn to god such that he defines he begins to define every single thing about your life so there's the aspect of repentance and then there is faith in jesus christ that you believe in the life that christ has given to you the the substitute the 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 life that he substituted and gave to you that he took your life and nailed it on the cross and gave you his life um this is I've pictured very well by the last supper in the last supper it wasn't just a last supper it wasn't just at i'm having my last meal with the disciples it was actually a transaction that the disciples were taking drinking the blood of jesus and the body of 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 jesus and jesus was taking now their lives and and that's why immediately after that moment he went into prayer and he was sweating blood and all it's because he had taken all their sin and now he he was feeling the weight mm. of and the intensity of the sin of not only the disciples because the disciples were a touch point but the sin of the world and so his life is now yours faith in jesus christ and then the third thing is being baptized uh being um it's it's there's there's being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ but also there's being baptized in the holy ghost so there are those two aspects whereby baptized in the name of Jesus Christ we baptize you in water and you you it, it's a public declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ so it's just a it's a public declaration of what i i had initially explained as your faith in jesus christ and then now there's baptism of the holy spirit whereby mm. he is the seal he is the 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 down payment he is the confirmation of the work of christ in your life he is the uh, the promise that that has now that is now dwelling in you he is the one who guides you into all truth he is the one who gives you the power the capacity mm. the knowledge the wisdom to be able to live the life that you have now been given so so that's how i see this 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 whole aspect yeah you have to be born again basically it entails you believing in what Jesus Christ did on the cross you know that's very fundamental mm. believing that he died mm. on the cross for the sins of the entire human race as well as also believing that he rose again from the dead on the third day because you know there are people who do not believe in the resurrection of Christ mm. and if we do not believe in the resurrection of Christ then our faith in him is in vain yeah oh, yeah that's true the resurrection is the epitome of our faith. Yeah. The resurrection is the culmination mm. of salvation mm. that he died and then he conquered death. He conquered sin and he conquered death and he disarmed the devil. He disarmed principalities and powers of darkness. He he trampled over them making, you know, you know, you know Paul talks about that in the Colossian epistle whereby he made a public spectacle Mm-hmm. of the principalities and powers of darkness yes you know he put them to shame and f- f- you know for when he actually rose from the dead he basically proved one thing that death has no power over the life of a human being in so far as uh, you know purpose is concerned mm-hmm. and um, you know salvation like we said in part 1 is of god it is not of man man cannot save himself salvation is of god in his timing and salvation is for the purpose of god not for the purpose of man mm-hmm. it is actually for the purpose of god and the other thing to underscore is that the 
eternal nature of salvation is not so much on the responsibility of the believer, uh -huh. but it has a lot to do with the infallibility of the eternal God. Mm. Uh -huh. Yes, there is the responsibility that the believer has, but the truth is, yeah. for salvation to be something um, that the, for, for it to be authentic, then we must understand something about the infallibility of God. We must know very well that uh, the eternal nature of salvation, it enables the believer to fully exploit the liberty and freedom that he has in Christ Jesus. Mm. As salvation, we are basically formatted to the divine setting. In other words, we go back to factory settings, if I may yeah. put it that way. But in this case, let's not use the word factory settings. We are basically formatted to the divine settings. In other words, we are taken back to the place of our origin. That's why to be born again basically means you're born from above. Uh -huh. What is it to be born from above? You're born from the place of your origin. I know many people, when whenever we hear the word to be born from above, we think of up there. That is really <laughs> not the thing. It's not about being born above. It basically means that you're born from your source. Mm -hmm. And God is our source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We are born again mm. from the place of our beginning mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. in other words being born again takes us back to the origin to, to the beginning the beginning of who we are what is it that god intended us to be because you see the bible says before we were formed in the womb of our mothers god knew us he tells mm -hmm. jeremiah i knew you and i ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations so that is to tell us that when you know when god comes to us the very first time he wants us to understand that there is a certain knowing that he had of us yes he comes to tell us who we were in him okay mm -hmm. not what we are yeah. because when god comes to us he finds us in a state of what we are Mm -hmm. our issues and so on but that it does not in any way talk about who we are and then um there is this scripture that i want us to talk about mm -hmm. uh maybe one of you can read it this is first peter chapter one from verse 10 to 12 if you can find that scripture uh kindly um offer yourself to read the scripture I mean, you probably go further to let us know from which uh, version of the bible you, you are reading from it's first peter 1 verse 10 to 12 to 12 okay i have the amplified classic edition um verse 10 says the prophets who prophesied of the grace, divine blessing, which was intended for you, searched and inquired honestly about this salvation. They sought to find out to whom or when this was to come, which the Spirit of Christ, working within them, was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow them. Verse 12. It was then disclosed to them that the services they were rendering were not meant for themselves and their period of time, but for you. It is these very things which have now already been made known plainly to you by those who preach to the good news, that is the gospel, to you by the same Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Into these things, the very angels long to look. When you look at that scripture, it is very clear that the Old Testament prophets did not always understand the message they were delivering. Mm. Uh -huh. They had the message, but they did not have the full revelation of the message because these were people who uh, received uh, divine inspiration from God uh, in types and in symbols. Most of, the, mo most of what they saw was basically foreshadowed, but they did not have the, f the full extent of the message. And that's why you see, when you look at what um, Apostle Peter is saying, is that the Old Testament prophets, they honestly sought understanding concerning that message, when and how it would, you know, be fulfilled. But it appears from this particular scripture we've read that that message was still a mystery until after the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. Meaning even when Christ came forth, the message was still not very, very clear 
until after he was crucified and then rose again from the dead. Um, and probably to prove that further, maybe somebody else can read uh, the following scripture. This is uh, Luke chapter 24, uh, verse 13, going down. Um, I can read mm-hmm. on the New Living Translation. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of, one of them, Cleophas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all these things that have happened here the last few days. What things, Jesus asked? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who would come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group and his followers were at his tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said that his body was missing and that they, and that they had seen angels who had told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets, all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By the time they were nearing a mouse and the, uh, at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were, to, he were going on. But they begged him, saying, Stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. Then they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And with the hour they were on their and within the hour they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and others who had gathered with them, who said, "The Lord has really risen." He appeared to Peter. Now you see, from the scriptures that you've read, it is crystal clear that. Um, even up to the time when Christ rose from the dead, you know, there were people who were still in the state of unbelief. Some of them were in a state of confusion because of how the events had occurred, uh, to the extent that even when he rose from the dead and his body was not no, was no longer there, uh, people began to question who may have stolen the body of Jesus, so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is that uh, it actually took the Lord himself yeah. to explain to these two uh, disciples of his, you know, going through the Old Testament. Oh. So in other words, in as much as these guys had the Old Testament, it was impossible for them to be able to discern the time of their visitation, if I may put it that way. They were not able to connect everything that Jesus was doing while he was alive to the point whereby he had to go through a lot of suffering. You know, of course, the culmination of it being his vicarious death. It didn't really occur to them that these things were prophesied in the Old Testament. That even at the point of rising from the dead, we are aware that uh, some of his apostles had doubts. They were very confused, you know. (laughs) It was not only Thomas, who is referred to as Doubting Thomas. Quite a number of them, they really struggled a lot with unbelief. And that's why you find that Jesus, 
um, there's what we, we refer in theological circle. Jesus was involved in post-resurrection ministry. Mm. It was a ministry that, uh, enabled, that, that, that enabled him to, to you know, bring these apostles to a place where they were able to now understand that what he went through was something that had already been prophesied. It was not just uh, 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 events that just happened for the purposes of it being chronicled, but it was something that was part and parcel of the grand purpose of God, that it pleased the Father that his son should suffer for the sake of humanity. But we are able to see that those of the Old Testament, they had no idea. They had no idea of this, of, of, of all these things. And that tells you that, you know, it is possible for you to have scripture, to memorize scripture, but you have no revelation yeah. as to what the scriptures talk about concerning Christ. Yeah, it's true. You know, and, uh, and, and I dare also submit that even in our day and age, despite the fact that we are able to read about how these people of the Old Testament had no revelation and also be able to compare ourselves with uh, these two disciples whom Jesus uh, was able to open the eyes of the understanding to what was written or rather what was said by Moses and the prophets of old. And we begin to think that we now have the revelation, we have the understanding. I dare submit that uh, most believers today have the information. Mm -hmm. Because my understanding of this whole account is that until the Spirit of God gives you a revelation mm -hmm. that is personal to you. Yes. Because revelation has got to be personal. Yes. For it to be life-changing, life-transforming. Until the Spirit of God enables you to understand these things deeper. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you'll just be a religious person who said the, the sinner's prayer. <laughs> And the truth is that there will be no transformation. You can join foundation class, like we call it in our church. You can go through discipleship and do everything. Maybe let me take it further. Be filled by the Spirit and speak in tongues, but that is all. You just speak in tongues. Tongues that you're not even persuaded of, but you speak in tongues because it feels cool. Hmm. Because truth of the matter is that when revelation dawns on you, it brings about an illumination. That that knowledge becomes experiential. Uh -huh. Because I believe that knowledge is something that we must encounter. Uh -huh. What is it that, that we are encountering as far as knowledge is concerned? We are encountering the knowledge of Christ. Uh -huh. That that knowledge becomes a reality within us. That salvation is not something we just take for granted. When I say that I'm born again, it is evident. You know, it is something which is life transforming. It is something that enables me to live for God. That nothing whatsoever can separate me from the love of God. And you know, friends, it's not just the Old Testament saints. Mm -hmm. We know very well from scriptures that even angels long to look into these things. Yeah. You know, funny enough, you know, angels are a mystery, but mm. they are created beings. Huh? Mm. And um, we know that uh, angels are also created by God and they operate within the spiritual realm. And uh, one of the roles that we know about angels in Hebrews 1.14 is that they minister to the elect of God. They mean, the, 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 the Bible refers to them as ministering spirits to those who are heirs of salvation. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you know, it's so funny that uh, it is hard to know anything definitely. But and, and you know, fine, fine enough, God did not see it fit to satisfy you know our curiosity concerning angels, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And you know, if angels are ministering spirits, then it therefore follows that they have an interest yes. in what is happening actually on earth. And when I talk about the earth, I'm talking about mankind. Angels are not interested in trees. They are not interested yeah. in tones. They are interested in what is going on in humanity. Mm -hmm. And if I may say this, the scriptures basically appear to imply that the angels were somewhat in the dark concerning God's plan. God's plan was never revealed <laughs> to them. They were in the dark, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, th that's the truth of the matter. And not just angels, the, the angels who, who are on the side of God, even satanic angels, 
you know? You see, the thing is, these spirits who rule this age, had they known what exactly God was doing, we know very well what Paul says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 8, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't know that by orchestrating the Jews to crucify Christ, they were basically fulfilling scripture. Mm. They were fulfilling the plan and purposes of God. Satan was doing whatever he could, and in his own twisted understanding, he thought that he was frustrating the plan yeah. and the purpose of God. Of course, he didn't want redemption to happen, but he, he had no understanding as to what it would entail and what God was up to. But the God being God, and because the purpose of God will never be held hostage by the schemes of men and the machinations of the underworld, Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day. Mm -hmm. And that's why you find that God's unfolding plan was kept secret, even from the angels who are faithful to him. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask this question. There are these angels who are faithful to God. I want you to try and ask yourself and maybe provide an answer if you can. Why would God not want to disclose his plan even to those angels who are faithful to him? Forget about the one third who decided to rebel. I mean, why would he not tell the, these angels who are faithful to him? What do you think would be the reason? The Bible doesn't tell us, but uh, probably we can just try and, 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 and answer the question. Why would it God just... Share with his angels. I mean, can you imagine Michael, the archangel, had no idea. <laughs> Gabriel, who used to, who, the guy who was always sent to deliver messages, had no idea. Why? I think that, um, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I, I, my thoughts are that um, the reason as to why God wouldn't reveal it to the angels is because there are certain mysteries that are reserved for sons and angels are not really supposed to have that information or that revelation. Reason being God designed angels to be ministering spirits. So by virtue of that and by virtue of the fact that there's a certain jurisdiction or place that angels were designed to operate in, there are certain things that they were not designed to behold. It was basically in God's mind and heart for man or sons to be able to decode those mysteries and now be able to effect certain things on the face of the earth. So I, I feel like the reason as to why angels may not have uh, an understanding or a knowledge about that is because that is information that was supposed to be held by sons. But the unfortunate thing is because of the fall, we of course have fallen short and continue to fall short of being able to, to grasp those mysteries. Yeah. But um, Evans, haven't you not read in some portions of scriptures whereby angels are referred to as sons of God? Mm -hmm. A yeah. good case in point is Job. When mm -hmm. the sons of God came to present themselves before God and Satan was among them. When you read about how the sons of God, they rejoiced at uh, the, the works of creation in the book of Proverbs. So... <laughs> When you say certain things are, are reserved for sons, so now how do we how, how do we justify the fact that angels who are referred to sons in other contexts of the Bible do not get that information? I think when you asked that question, for me, this scripture came to mind. Um, Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And it just rang in my head that um, what, what even Paul says in Colossians, that Christ is the firstborn of all creation. It pleased God that Christ would be the one to present this mystery himself to the world and so that's why he wouldn't uh, reveal it to angels he wouldn't reveal it even to the the prophets of old but he revealed it in his son Jesus Christ that that's what pleased God that Christ himself 
would be the first to present the mystery of who he is. Um, it's it's even a beautiful picture because um, it is a lover coming to introduce himself to the beloved. You know, he's not sending uh, other people to 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 like mm. like to do the work for him. He he himself is coming to woo the beloved, you know. So that's why I think he did not reveal it to even the the angels who are now the messengers, um, who who bring the message. Yes, there are those glimpses and shadows and types that were revealed in the Old Testament, but these were um, pointers. These were just pointers that would help us know who Jesus is when he came to present himself. It, it, they, were, they were to help us have, when, when he reveals himself, we have an understanding that from the beginning of time until now and forevermore, he has always been at work. He has always been uh, pursuing us. So, yeah. So I think that's why he would keep it hidden from everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And then also given the fact that, um, you know, there's mm. a difference between uh, mankind and angels. Mm. You know, angels are basically referred to as ministering spirits. But man is supposed to be the image and likeness of God. You know, mm. the kind of uh, sonship that we have is very different from angels who are referred to in other portions of scriptures as sons of God. Our sonship is by reason of the fact that uh, uh, salvation had a lot to do with the plan and purpose of God concerning mankind. Mm. That mankind may be restituted in him. It has a lot to do with what God had intended. That man should forever live with him, live in him, and move in him. It is something that we don't see with um, with uh, with angels. That's the truth of the matter, you know. Despite the fact that they faithfully serve God, you know, they this, there are certain things that are never revealed to to them, and this is a rebuke to people, you know, just because you faithfully serve God. It doesn't mean that some things are meant for you. Mm. Mm. That is rebuke number one. Rebuke number two, when someone has fallen into sin, don't be quick to rejoice. The angels did not rejoice when man fell. The angels mourned. And that is why any time when God gave his angels uh, commands to be able to minister, to mankind from the Old Testament all the way, you find that the angels carried out the commands of God judiciously, mm. you know, because at the end of it all, the fall of man did not mean that was the end of man. Mm. On the contrary, the fall of man was something that had already been predicted and God knew it was going to happen anyway. But the good thing about God is that he had already prepared a plan. But the thing is, Every member of the human race has the choice to decide whether to follow God or not. And that's why even when we look at uh, uh, people in our society today, the human society, those that may probably be living a reckless life, and even some of those who are purportedly born again, but they're living a double life, um, you know, it's not in our place to pass judgment on them. Because, beloved, when we think that we know the end of someone yeah. know very well that what might appear to be the end of an individual may probably be the beginning of God doing a work in the life of a particular person. So salvation was part of God's purpose and it was kept secret since the world began. You know, this salvation was a hidden wisdom from before the world that was revealed to Paul to teach and preach to the world, you know. This is basically what Paul says when he's uh, writing the, his second epistle to Timothy. When you read from verse 1, uh, uh, you know, verse 1, or rather, sorry, chapter 1, verse uh, 9 
uh, to 11. Maybe we can actually read that particular scripture yeah. so that we are able to capture it well. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 from verse 9 to 11 this is the NKJV version who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began but has now been revealed by the appearing of our savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel to which I was appointed a preacher an apostle and a teacher of the gentiles for this reason I also suffer these things nevertheless I am not ashamed for I am for I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day so you see from that scripture the apostle says that we have been saved according to god's purpose mm. not according to our own works yeah mm. not according to our efforts mm. you know salvation is a gift mm. it is a gift from God to yeah. us. Uh-huh. No one can boast about being saved because of his works. You don't have to work hard to be saved. You just need to believe in what Christ did on the cross. You know, you know this kind of uh, process. It looks very simple, but at the same time it basically it slays the the religious who are prideful who think that they are you know the, the, their own lifestyle of being a um, men or men who are full of uh, you know uh, uh, r- 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 religious gimmicks that when i do this that's when the lord will see me and the truth of the matter is that god is not mesmerized by the long prayers we make and it's good to pray yeah. but god is not mesmerized by the long prayers we make god is not mesmerized by how the things we do in church god is not mesmerized by the number of times we help the poor what god wants is for us to believe in what christ did yeah because when we believe in what christ G- did uh, uh, what happens is there is that transformation that that takes place within us that causes us to be able to have the right perspective even how to serve god that we are not serving god based on self righteousness we are serving god on account of the righteousness of christ yeah. because we are justified by christ and what is it that causes us to be justified it is his blood mm. that makes us to be judiciously declared righteous mm. we are not declared righteous based on what we've done or what we've done if anything mm. all of the bible says all have seen and have fallen short, short of the glory of god yeah. that is very fundamental and that's why we love it when we read the scriptures we know very well that the scriptures they are able to make us wise unto salvation you know mm-hmm. That is what the Bible says and that's what Paul is basically saying. And that's why um you really need to understand that uh, the whole doctrine of salvation it's basically an elucidation of the manifold wisdom of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. This is and you know this is a very really interesting wisdom whereby one would wonder you know how can God just justify sinners sinners are supposed to be condemned <laughs> i mean if you sin you should die <laughs> and i can as well quote us a particular scripture out of context the soul that sinneth shall die mm-hmm. yeah you've stolen you're of the devil you need to die mm-hmm. <laughs> you've killed somebody you need to die mm-hmm. yes you know yes I I could actually say that and that's why and, and that's why when you look at scripture we we must understand that there is a basis in which God justifies sinners you know let's read Romans chapter 3 from verse 25 to to 26 maybe Lily this would actually be yours since the rest of red <laughs> Uh, 
uh, Romans chapter 3 from verse 25. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present in the present time. God this, did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Mm-hmm. The last part, you know, in, uh, in, 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 in the King James, he says that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Mm. Can you imagine that God is just, but he's the one who justifies people who believe in Christ, not people who believe in their strength, mm. not people who justify their works. Mm. Yeah. That are, you know, whereby like Cain, you offer a sacrifice of the fruit from the ground. You do everything, you take care of your crops, you guard them day and night, making sure none of them would actually, you know, dry up and so on. And then you bring a sacrifice and you know very well, God has to, he has to justify me because yeah. I brought this crop. And then uh, the brother by the name of Abel, him, he did nothing. Him, he was a shepherd. He decides to offer the firstborn of his flock, you know, the King James refers to it as the firstlings, and then the fat portions thereof. And then God looked at Abel and what he presented, and he had respect to what Abel brought. But as for Cain, he rejected what Cain uh, offered as a sacrifice. Mm. Because Cain was basically offering a sacrifice from the place of self-righteousness. I have worked so hard. Mm. And therefore, God should honor me. And, uh, you know, many times we think that when we are so hardworking, <laughs> that's now when God justifies us. Unfortunately, when it comes to scripture, uh, there is no such a thing as being hardworking in order to be saved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To be saved is a very simple thing. Mm-hmm. Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in what he did. Yeah. Whether you are hardworking or not, believe. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you stole or not, or you don't steal, you must believe in what Christ did. Mm. You know, I look at it as ground zero. Everybody's got at ground zero, whereby self righteousness, reputation is slain. Yeah. Nothing is, there's nothing that acknowledges you before God. Mm. What acknowledges you, what makes you acknowledge in the sight of God is by believing in His Son and what He's actually accomplished for you. And that is why the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith yeah you know mm-hmm. the religious people need to capture that we are saved by grace unmerited favor through faith it is a gift of god lest any man should boast mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and a lot of brethren should be very careful about bragging you know you brag a lot uh, or you know about your achievements in, the, in, in, in your walk with God, in your faith. You brag a lot about how many verses in the Bible you know. Mm. You even know where the punctuation marks are. Mm. And funny enough, you know you can cram, you, you know you can memorize scripture, but you have no revelation. Mm. Mm. You know, you're just, um, how would I put it? It's like you're, you, you're, you're a robot that can speak. Mm. You just, you know, we, we hear your voice, but the truth is that, first of all, you have, you have no revelation and, and you do not even live that life. Actually, you don't even believe in whatever you've actually memorized, you know? That's something very, very important. And, um, you, know, you know, Titus tells us that the grace of God that bringeth forth salvation, it appeared to all men, okay? Mm. And wh- why did it appear? It appeared to teach men to say no to all manner of ungodliness. You know, many people keep saying that they are are operating by the grace of God, but they keep sinning. (laughs) Why do they sin? What what is it? Because you hear somebody saying, I have the grace to do this, but the person is sinning. Or when a person has struggled with a matter for a long time, he or she says that the grace has lifted. And where they're going, they struggle even more, and there's a lot of sin. What really is the problem? Is it that people do not understand the concept of 
this whole thing called grace and how it relates to salvation, please tell me. <laughs> what do you think? Hmm? I think sometimes it boils down to people's understanding of the definition of grace. Mm-hmm. Um, if you understand grace as a supernatural enablement, you will understand that it is uh, something that empowers you to to live right, to do right. But, uh, it's not just a, a blanket that you throw all your data under. Because that's how people understand grace. Like it's a blanket that you throw under, a data under rather than a supernatural kind of empowerment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can I hear from the rest of the other gentlemen? <laughs> yeah, I think I think what you said is right. Like I I think people do not really have an understanding of of grace and the minute you encounter grace, there's a there's a humility that hits you that you're able to really understand where life is truly derived from. Mm. Where um, anything that is good mm. comes from. And so we we can never really be true believers if we are not students of, of grace, of understanding what God has really done through Christ Jesus. Mm. We have to be mm. uh, submitted to really understanding and learning and embracing mm. um embracing this reality by faith because i've even come i've even come to realize it's not even in just knowing it but it's in receiving the love of god yeah. because we, we we can spend a lot of time um pursuing knowledge, pursuing knowledge, pursuing knowledge, but it is love that builds the church. It is love that builds us up. So if we are able to learn to receive, and that takes a lot of us just being in the place of surrender, us realizing that we do not know things on our own, we do not function on our own, we do not have apart from God, we can do nothing. We do not have capacity on our own. Just acknowledging that and being in the place of surrender such that when God calls upon you to do something, um, you just do it. Um, I was sharing with uh, guys at home when we were fellowshipping that in this period that we we, we desire to, we, we're going into a time where we are really seeking God in prayer and fasting and I, I was saying my desire is just to be in that place where I just do what God has told me to do because over time God has been speaking but we 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 put wisdom we try and justify things and put our own ideas and things like that but we just don't simply do what he has said because when we do what he has said we actually get to experience the grace we actually receive the grace that he has already given to us so it's 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 that simple it's it's not a scientific thing that you have to <laughs> figure out or <laughs> something like that but it is a re- receiving receive it learn to just receive just surrender and receive mm. and therein is where we we get to start to understand what grace really is mm. uh, i think for me i, I just want to agree with with both of you um but overall i feel like how I can term it is familiarity. I feel like people generally are familiar and what has made them familiar is religion because people sometimes get saved because they want to identify with a particular religion. In this case, it's Christianity. So because there's no other religion that seems to appear as though it's either favorable or it, it seems to fit 
within maybe their space or their circle of people that they like spending time with. So then they, they now get saved. And then now because they have to fill government documents, they write on those government documents that I am a Christian. And by virtue of me being a Christian, automatically I am saved. But I, I, I don't think that that in itself is right. And I think that's now where what leads to people taking the grace of God for granted because they think because we, we go to church on Sunday, I can live my life any anyhow I'd like to live it from Monday to, to Friday or to Saturday. And then I just come to church on Sunday like nothing happened during the course of the week and continue doing the same thing, rinse and repeat, week in, week out. Um, and I think to me, that is now the beginning of taking the grace of God for granted where I, I forsake the what exactly God is saying to me during the course of the week and the things that he is expecting of me outside of the corporate fellowship, you know, because salvation is something that is so sacrosanct. It's something that is very, very personal. Mm -hmm. It's not something that because we are millennials and because it looks like something that's trending, then now we all get saved so that now we can all be in this clique and delude ourselves that we are actually pursuing God. But it's something that's very, very personal. And if you look at the men of old in the Bible and you look at Christ himself, he set a template where he showed people that having a relationship with him is something that is very, very personal because it's a heart issue. It's not something that is, is physical. It's more spiritual. It's more internal. It's more intrinsic than external. So I feel like the, the challenge most of the time is actually religion and the fact that through religion, people have become very familiar with the things that God is saying through the written word, as well as what he has also said via the spoken word, the Rema. You know, when you accept God's grace, let God's grace change you. Mm. The grace of God comes into our lives to teach us to say no to ungodliness, Mm -hmm. and to also instruct us on how to live a godly life. Yes. That's the truth of the matter, beloved. Grace isn't an excuse to sin. Mm -hmm. you, you don't begin to say, let me sin because the grace of God will abound where sin, where, where sin existed, the grace of God abounded them. But you know, there are people who quote that particular portion of scripture mm -hmm. that Paul talks about in Romans. And they don't really understand what, what exactly Paul was talking about. God's grace is not an excuse for us to sin. We must look at grace as the undeserved forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are not being forgiven. Or rather, we are not forgiven because we deserve it. It is undeserved, beloved. And we must also look at sin as defined by the word of God. Yes. Not what society defines sin. You know, unfortunately, we are so modulated by everything that society tells us to the point that now society has actually come up with definitums for certain uh, terminologies that uh, we see used in scripture. So sin is not what society says. Sin is what the word of God says, and it has to be that way. And the other thing is, we must also look at grace as God's power. You know, mm. when uh, Paul talks about uh, a messenger from Satan who came to buffet him, and then the Lord tells him what? That my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So you must understand that grace is God's power given to us, especially when we are weak. Mm. Okay? Because, you know, the power of God works best at the point whereby we have no otherwise but to rely on him because apart from him, we are weak. Yeah. So we must bring ourselves to the place of total reliance to God because we are basically acknowledging that we have no power in ourselves and of ourselves to be able to overcome the struggles that we experience in life. That's the truth of the matter. That... We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And the reason why we are able to do all things through Christ is because of grace. Mm. That is a grace that I know. Not this grace that uh, people say now, just because you've reached a point and you failed a couple of times in school, you say the grace to do this degree is over. <laughs> it's lifted. 
you know. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, there is no applicability of grace there. You have just failed, either because of laziness or maybe you chose the wrong course, you know. So grace is not an excuse for failure. Mm. Let's not use the grace of God to hide, you know. Mm-hmm. If you are someone who's married, like you guys are married, and you collide with your spouse, don't say now, there's no more grace in this marriage. I'm fighting for divorce, you know? Mm-hmm. Because basically what you're doing, you're, you are going against your own vows. Yes. You know? The grace cannot be lifted just because of the fact that you've had a disagreement with your spouse. You know, unless if your spouse just decides that she does no, she, she no longer wants anything to do with your fish, you know, you, you cannot force despite what. But the thing is this, let's not use grace as an excuse to abdicate responsibility. I think that is something that uh, people often do. If things are not working, maybe at the workplace, the grace has lifted for me to be in this company. I need to, to transition uh, look for greener pastures. And where you're going, apparently the grass is not green, it's very brown. It's very, very brown. To the rest of the other guys that you meet in that company, it's green. But for you, it's brown. Uh. Why? Because you're running away from responsibility. Because yeah. many times people do not want to take personal responsibility. I tend to believe that grace is not a license for us to be lazy. Yes. Grace is an obligation it is a responsibility for us to live right and ensure that we go through the due process of learning the lessons we ought to learn in, 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 in the succession of seasons that we go through, beloved. Because, beloved, in Christ Jesus, oh, you have fulfilled all your seasons in Him. In Him. And the other thing we also get to know is that the grace of God is also forgiveness. You know, when grace appears to you, what well, that means is that God forgives you. And he does not forgive you because of the fact that you deserve to be forgiven. He forgives you because, number one, it is within his nature to forgive you. He forgives you because you have believed in what his son Jesus Christ has done. You don't get forgiveness because of uh, the number of people that you brought to church or how you have expanded your denomination. Mm or uh, the fact that you you wear your Sunday best going to church, that you're able to sing well in the choir, and all these things that people are pursuing, those are things that will never earn your salvation. You only earn salvation by believing in what Jesus Christ has done. That is basically what salvation is. And when we get that one clear, it will basically resolve some of the many struggles we have in church whereby you serve in a department and no one seems to be acknowledging you, not even the pastor, you know? And then you get frustrated and you feel like there's no more grace to serve here because you're not acknowledged, you know? You, you're a worship leader, you sing like an angel, and then unfortunately, somebody else who does not have a voice that is as good as yours begins to minister, but as that person ministers, God moves. But when you are trying to minister, there's no move. There's such a resistance. And then you begin to feel so bad about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's basically a rebuke. You know, (laughs) it's so funny. Grace has no acknowledgement of our talents. (laughs) Because furthermore, who who gave you that talent? Let's begin from there. You know, sometimes we we misuse the things that God has given to us freely and we make them ours and that we only use them on condition that we are recognized, on, on, on condition that we receive some reward. And that is where now we get it wrong. So the only reward you get mm-hmm. is that, yes, you will sing, yes. you'll play an instrument and uh, people will look at you and they'll not be moved. <laughs> but somebody else who understands the grace of God, is able to sing by faith, play an instrument by faith, but God moves. And you begin to wonder why, how come God is moving and this guy does not even know how to play the guitar? 
you're forgetting that the grace of God overlooks many things. It overlooks our weaknesses. It overlooks our shortcomings. You know, you are a prayer warrior when you pray. It feels as though the heavens are actually the ones speaking through you, because as you pray, you pray within Scripture, mm. but there's no breakthrough. There is no burden. There is dryness. But someone who is maybe a new believer but understands grace, my friend, when that guy starts praying, the whole church starts weeping. Mm. And the next thing you want to fight to that guy, you want to frustrate that person. You say that this person is not in the spirit. The truth is, you're the one not in the spirit <laughs> because instead of you focusing in prayer, you're focusing on the fact that somebody else is a competitor of you that probably might want to to take over as head of your department when in, in, in actual sense it's not even in the pastor's mind. <laughs> grace is funny. Grace does not look out for the things that you and I are looking out for. Grace mm-hmm. is concerned more about the person who believes in what Jesus has done. So that when we are serving God even in church, we are serving God on account of the fact that we believe in what Jesus Christ did mm-hmm. and that our life is founded on the works, the vicarious work of Jesus on the cross, not our own self-righteousness. So ladies and gentlemen, it's been wonderful. This brings us to the end of uh, the last part of the series of salvation. Uh, Thank you so much, Bishop, for that really, really intense (laughs) posting. I have personally been blessed. I trust that my fellow brethren as well here have have really been blessed. I think I am really, really challenged to to really be practical in my faith because I realized (laughs) it's so easy to make this thing very positional and just think we are just saved because it is convenient. Mm -hmm. But on the contrary, we we are saved because we have yielded ourselves to the spirit of God and to Christ. Um, Here's what I found. uh, Thank you so much for joining us today and also for this series. We hope that you will still join us as well for the next episode of Spiritual Civilization. Be blessed.